Hello, in this number 31 in our video series on the Catholic theological tradition, we're going to be fleshing out Lutheranism. The Lutheran stream is the first stream of a classical Protestant Reformation. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it in terms of the beginning of three battle cries or three slogans that are announced three banners that are waved by the Lutheran reformers. And actually, these three banners are picked up by all the reformers. And you're going to see there's other streams that, that emerge from this movement. Uh, but uh, the Lutheran stream, which is the first, um, carries banners that, all are, that are picked up by everybody. The first banner is sola scriptura, which really means scripture alone as ultimate infallible authority, not tradition. So the Sola Scriptura really is an appeal to not let tradition, human traditions, get in the way of the Word of God. That's the idea. So the, the, the Bible is the only ultimate infallible authority. A lot of church tradition, said the Reformers, is of late medieval origin, and it's corrupt. So we got to get rid of it. Um, it's a selective tradition, really. If you get to, if you really look at Luther, Luther is actually very traditional in many respects. There's a lot of things about the Catholic tradition that Luther loves, and Luther actually starts new traditions. The Advent wreath is of Lutheran origin, and it's now traditional for us. So he's not against thing everything that's in tradition. He's against anything that he thinks and he judges, is contrary to Scripture. So for Luther, sola scriptura means anything in tradition contrary to Scripture must be rejected. There's a much more radical sola scriptura that we'll see in other streams. Okay, now just keep something in mind. It's really hard for anybody in this era to know what apostolic tradition is academically from documents because none of the apostolic fathers, the earliest of the fathers of the church, and many of the great um, apologists and controversialists like Justin and Irenaeus, they're not known. They're not available at this point in time. So Luther doesn't have that, um, that basis so he, that he can look at to see what is truly of medieval origin, what is of ancient apostolic origin. Um, what Luther really proposes, you know, this, the whole idea of sola scriptura begs the question, who says what scripture really says? And for Luther, he, it's not at all that every person can interpret scripture for themselves. That's really not Luther's idea. He's a teacher, magister, a master. And so really it's the great scholars who have the right to interpret scripture. So really what you got is a magisterium of scholars in this new reform movement. Okay, um, he's a Christian humanist. He knows what Paul means. He knows what scripture says. So it's scholars now calling the shots and interpreting scripture, the infallible scripture. But interestingly enough, Luther is selective with scripture. He finds a canon within the canon. He interprets all scripture in light of Romans and Galatians and not even all of Romans and Galatians. So it's not all of Paul. You know, it's Romans, Galatians, and those sections, and also Ephesians 2, you know, that talk about salvation by grace through faith, not that anything that we could do. So you just keep that in mind, that he sets that up as the center of Scripture by which everything else in Scripture must be interpreted. He also makes an arbitrary decision to accept the Jewish canon and therefore to cut out seven books that Catholics and Christians have been accepting since the time of the Fathers. He points to St. Jerome, who agrees with this. But keep in mind, Jerome is not a bishop. Jerome, again, is a scholar who's living in Israel. And um, when it comes down to bishops who rely on what the church has been using in their diocese since the time of the apostles, you got everybody accepting Maccabees. Maccabees was really important for early Christian martyrs. Everybody's accepting Sirach. Sirach called Ecclesiasticus.
is used heavily in catechesis of the catechumens because their catechumenate was a lot about moral instruction and you got a lot of that in Sirach as well as Proverbs. So anyway, um, what he cuts out, there's a short little phrase that makes it easy to remember the seven books that Luther cuts out because the Jews don't have them in their canon. Um, and it's J.T. Webb and the two McCabes. So <laughs> Judith, Tobit, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, otherwise known as Sirach, Baruch, and parts of, of Daniel, and parts of, um, and, and the, the two Maccabees meaning Maccabee 1 and Maccabee 2. Um, but anyway, parts of Daniel also are excluded. So um, anyway, th this is part of what Luther does with scripture. Uh, one convenient reason to cut out uh, Second Maccabees is it, it tends, it makes clear that it's a good and pious thing to pray for the dead. And Luther later in his career um, goes to being against prayers for the dead. Okay, now here's the one battle cry, Sola Scriptura. Here's another battle cry. Sola Fide, by faith alone. Justification is by faith alone. Now, alone is added by Luther. You won't find justification by faith alone anywhere in Scripture. In fact, you find in James uh, that it's not by faith alone. Now, the thing is, we've got to be honest and clear here. You've got to define your terms, right? So when James says it's not by faith alone that we're saved, he is he's basically talking about intellectual belief in God. When Luther talks about salvation by faith, he's talking about more than intellectual belief. He's talking about what Paul typically talks about, which is a total personal adherence and surrender to God, a trust in God, and trust in God for our salvation. It's belief that, that the Lord really has died for me, and I'm going to surrender to that gift. So faith is much more holistic uh, for Paul and for Luther than it would be for in the letter of James. Uh, sadly enough, Luther calls James an epistle of straw because he doesn't quite kick it out of the canon, but he looks down on it because it doesn't have his chief doctrine in it, salvation by faith alone. So that kind of shows you how Luther does a little violence to Scripture um, and the balance of Scripture by focusing on one thing and making everything fit into that one doctrine. Okay, for him, salvation is very legal. Justification is a metaphor. It's a legal metaphor you know, of someone being declared innocent in a law court. But Luther forgets it's a metaphor and he pushes it way too far. This is one of the problems in theology. No metaphor, Thomas Aquinas would say, no analogy is adequate to the reality. So a legal declaration by God that we're innocent based on what Jesus did, that's an image. Um, and, but justification is a little bit more than that. For Luther, it's just a decree, God wiping um, away our sin in the law book based on what Jesus did. It's not anything intrinsic where God changes us. And Luther uses metaphors like, you know, we're filthy and we're just covered by snow, you know, by, the, by the, what Jesus did. God looks at Jesus instead of looking at our continued stinking sin. So anyway, this is one of the problems with the way Luther talks about justification. He so overemphasizes, you know, one metaphor and one image that he seems to give the impression that we're not changed when, when we are justified. Um, works don't cause justification, but flow from it. Uh, that's one of his emphasis. Okay, he's not against works. He's totally into righteous living, but he sees works as flowing from justification. So um, uh, for him, free will, he's very negative on free will. Um, and if you, if you know, if you keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of people who, who go in this route, go to this, in this direction in the Protestant movement. If you remember with Thomas Aquinas, free will is not destroyed. It's just weakened. Human nature is not destroyed and totally corrupt. It's weakened and flawed. But for Luther, free will is destroyed. He overemphasizes the depravity caused by sin, um, uh, the total corruption of human nature. And this is very clear in a later document, the Formula of Concord, which kind of defines Lutheran orthodoxy. I'm just going to say Luther says stuff like this. He's not a systematic theologian. He's more of a prophetic figure. Uh, he's not concerned a lot with a lot of precision and balance, you know. Later on, some of his, his approaches get really hardened and systematized by the Lutheran theologians. 
and this is one of them. All right, so the third battle cry after sola scriptura, after sola fide, the third one is sola gratia. It's by the grace of God, not the law, that we're saved. And again, you can read, you can read Paul here, read Galatians coming through here. Um, emphasis is on the graciousness of God in Jesus Christ. Luther is very Christocentric, not so much theocentric, but Christocentric. So he, and he says that when it comes to the law, that there's only two uses for the law. What good is the law? There's only two uses of it. One is the theological use of the law. The law exists to show us just how bad we are and how much we can't earn God's salvation, how lost we are. So it's to make us, shake us into reality, shake us up and make us realize we need a savior. That's the theological use of the law. And then there's the civil use of the law. We do have evildoers and our government needs to have law whereby they can judge evildoers and restrain evil. He's very much into the restraint of the ungodly by the government. Um, and we'll see this a little bit later. So um, there's a sharp dichotomy in him between the law and the gospel. Um, he takes Paul and runs with that particular, you know, when Paul talks about law and gospel, he takes that and really runs with it and makes a very sharp distinction between them. All right, so these are the three battle cries. Next, let's talk about the sacraments. Since sacraments were the issue that got him excommunicated and, and continue to be the real, one of the real problems, let's, let's talk about that, okay? Number one, baptism. He believes in the priesthood of all believers which is biblical, and it is part of Catholic doctrine that has been not terribly well emphasized at all in the Middle Ages. But you'll find it beautifully emphasized in the fathers, like Leo the Great. Um, you can go to DrItaly.com, CrossroadsInitiative.com, my website, and you can put in Leo the Great, Priesthood of All Believers, and you'll find a beautiful thing that Leo says about this issue. Um, so he revives and recalls the priesthood of all believers, which is a really good thing. And so he emphasizes that baptism is conferring this great dignity upon everyone. And honestly, there's been such an emphasis on religious profession that there's not been a lot of emphasis on the glories of the baptized and laity. So this, in large part, is a good contribution of Luther. Um, he also says that infant baptism is uh, important. So Luther is very strong about infant baptism, the need for infant baptism, the rightness, the, the appropriateness of this. Okay, so with baptism, we don't have a problem with Luther. With Eucharist, we do. Uh, on the one hand, Luther, he's very much into the real presence. He loves the Eucharist and believes in the real presence. Um, and he's actually, this is where the Protestant Reformation breaks apart between the Lutheran stream and a stream that comes out of Switzerland that we're going to talk about next. Because uh, one of the other magisterial reformers named Zwingli did not believe in the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist. And Luther and he argued about this very bitterly. Um, so he's against Zwingli, he's against the fanatics who deny the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. But he does not explain it in a way that is satisfactory from a Catholic point of view. He takes issue, he's against transubstantiation. I don't believe Luther really understands Thomas Aquinas very well. Thomas, again, has not been the main guy being taught. He's under a cloud. What Luther has gotten really has been nominalist theology. So he doesn't understand Thomas. He's not been schooled in Thomas. Thomas explains substantial change, what we call transubstantiation, very beautifully. Um, Luther rejects it without really understanding it. And all the Protestant Reformation, every single person uh, in the Reformation, every single teacher is unanimous in rejecting transubstantiation, also rejecting Mass as a sacrifice. Well, first, with transubstantiation, real presence, um, I'm just going to say that Luther teaches consubstantiation, that through uh, the, in the Mass, the, the, the species, the bread and wine, become the body and blood of Christ and the bread and wine. And he uses an image that Christ is both God and man. And so like that, the, the bread and wine are both bread and wine and the body and blood of Christ. Okay, now 
This theologically, I'm not going to get into all this um, because it's not a sacraments class and we don't have time to go through it really well. I'd have to explain transubstantiation, which I don't have really time to do. But if for Catholics, the bread and wine no longer are ordinary bread and wine. I mean, go back to Justin Martyr. He says this. Irenaeus says it, that there's a transformation that takes place. And so this is now the body and blood of Christ. Okay, not, and so there's a transformation, not a consubstantiation that goes on. Um, the Mass, so that's, the, you know, the, there's an idea of the real presence much more than in other Protestants, but it's, a, it's not an idea that is uh, acceptable explanation from a Catholic point of view. All right, how about the Mass as a sacrifice? I told you that the early church saw unanimously the fathers, that the Eucharist fulfills a prophecy of Malachi 1, 11, where um, there's a, a, a sacrifice, a pure sacrifice offered throughout the world by the Gentiles that's predicted, prophesied by Malachi, in contradistinction to the polluted sacrifice of the Levitical priests who were giving God blemished animals, etc. So the church sees the Eucharist as a fulfillment of this. And so you see it as sacrifice mentioned in Clement. You see it mentioned everywhere as sacrifice. Okay. And priests, those who are presiding over the community as those who offer the sacrifice, for example. All right. But for Luther, see, he has this idea that if you admit that the mass is a sacrifice, that, that rivals what happened on Calvary. There's only one sacrifice, the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And he sees th this, as, th this idea of the mass as a sacrifice as adding to, as if Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough, adding to what happened on Calvary. And also as a work where we are trying to earn our salvation by some work in instead of relying on what Christ did for us on the cross, okay? Now, that's a misunderstanding of traditional Catholic theology, but just think, theology is in such a terrible place that it's, it, he hasn't received an adequate teaching on, uh, like, like Aquinas would give or the Fathers would give on the Eucharist. He's getting poor nominalist teaching on the Eucharist. Um, that, you know, that, that's all he's gotten. So he's not working with, he's not working with great sources and he's not working with a great scholastic tradition. It's decadent scholasticism that he knows, not the high point of scholasticism of the Middle Ages uh, that we have in Bonaventure and Thomas, okay? So I would just like to point out to you from a Catholic point of view that we only believe there's one sacrifice and that's the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But that sacrifice is represented. Uh, we don't crucify Christ again in the Mass. That, that sacrifice, that one sacrifice, is made present. But, it, but in a certain way, we are members of Christ's body. And so we, according to Colossians 1.24, fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And what that really means is we add, we ex in, in us is the expansion of his sacrifice. So we put on the altar uh, our sacrifices of, of trying to serve the Lord, serve the Father through him, with him, in Christ. We put that on the altar. It's joined to the magnificent, perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And, and together, Christ, head and members, offers this sacrifice to the Father. Now, this is the idea of the fathers of the church that Luther doesn't have. This is the authentic idea of the mass as a sacrifice. It's not an addition. But this is what Luther's objecting to is not authentic Catholic doctrine. Okay. Unfortunately, the, the people in dialogue can't really explain this to each other. Um, it's not fully understood. We're in a much better position now to overcome this problem than they were then. Okay. So that's the real problem uh, that we have with the mass. Now, how about penance? Luther really believed in confession, but he waffled back and forth whether it was a sacrament. So the, the only two sacraments he absolutely unequivocally agrees are instituted by Christ are baptism and Eucharist, because he has a very explicit and narrow idea of Christ instituting a sacrament. The fathers of the church would see confirmation instituted two times implicitly. One is when Jesus himself receives the spirit after he comes up after his baptism. Some fathers point to that as the institution of confirmation or the anointing that we receive in Christ, the chrismation we receive. Others would point to Pentecost. 
Um, so in any event, you know, the, Luther has this very wooden idea. If Jesus doesn't say, I do this in memory of me or baptize in the name of the Father, then he's not instituting a sacrament. Um, the church has a much more uh, fluid idea of Christ implicitly by sending the apostles out to, um, to, to heal. He's instituting the sacrament of, whole, of, of uh, the anointing. And in, in telling them on Easter Sunday, uh, John 20, uh, 19 and to 22, you know, b I breathe on you, receive the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you forgive shall be forgiven. The church sees that as an institution of penance. Um, you know, so Christ calling himself the bridegroom, he's instituting marriage as a sacrament, performing his first wedding, his, his first miracle at the, the wedding feast of Cana. Okay, so the church has much broader idea of implicit, Jesus implicitly teaching um, about the sacraments and instituting the sacraments. So Luther is very, very literal. Um, it's got to be, you know, Jesus has to say it. Otherwise, it's not fully a sacrament. With confession, here's the problem he has. People need to hear they're forgiven. But no need for penance. This assignment of penance, this is bad because this is works. Okay, there are people who can't earn their forgiveness. It's a free gift. Well, the Catholic idea of penance, penance is not earning your salvation. You receive absolution, but you, you must go out and do some rehabilitation, some reparation. Um, this is an expression of number one, healing and rehab for you. And number two, a uh, service to the church to repair some of the harm you did. It's not earning your forgiveness. So he misunderstands the role of the penance in the sacrament of penance, and he objects to that. Um, the thing that really messes things up is holy orders. He denies, because he's so strong on the, the baptism as consecrating us as priests, uh, the baptismal priesthood, the priesthood of the lady, priesthood of the baptized, he's so strong on that he feels like he has to deny the sacramental priesthood. So he does. He says that really um, all the pastors are, are professionals. They have uh, authority to preside and pastor and teach, but they don't receive any special sacramental power to confect sacraments. So what makes the sacraments happen? It's the faith of the church. The faith of the church makes uh, the Eucharist happen. So this is the real problem. And therefore, the, the Lutherans and the Protestants lose the sacrament of holy orders. They stop ordaining people to, it, it, to um, sacramental priesthood, a sacrificial priesthood. And therefore, uh, they lose valid sacraments other than baptism, which doesn't rely on the sacrament of holy orders. They, they also have valid, we believe, marriage is a sacrament. Luther denies marriage is a sacrament because he says marriage is a natural good. It's a natural blessing. It's not a sacrament instituted by Christ that confers grace. But we accept Protestant um, marriages as sacramental marriages because it's the spouses that confer the sacrament on each other in our theology. So anyway, I'm, I'm talking about Catholic theology now of the West. Um, but anyway, this is the real deal breaker with the Lutherans. It, it's, not, it's not so much the issue of justification by faith. In 1999, there was a very important document signed by many um, Catholic theologians, including Joseph Ratzinger, later Benedict XVI. It was also signed by the Lutheran World Federation. And in that document, it basically says that in the Reformation, the two sides on the issue of grace, faith, and justification were using, were saying reconcilable things in different terms. That the teaching of Luther and the teaching of the Catholic Church in Trent are not irreconcilable. It's not a deal breaker. This is not the deal breaker issue. There are apologists who keep fighting this issue, Lutherans and Catholics, but they don't realize that, they're, that their best theologians and pastors have said this is not a deal breaking issue. What is? Uh, rejection of the magisterium, rejection of tradition, and rejection, therefore, of sacraments. Luther making scholars the magisterium instead of the bishops, rejecting um, the sacrament of holy orders and other sacraments. These are the real deal breakers with, with Lutherans right now that we need to work on. I think there's a lot of hope for work to be done in this area. There has been a lot of progress in the last 30, 40, 50 years. There still needs to be more progress in these areas.